All right, so you heard about how I got involved with it through my father. He put together a documentary. It actually was published, uh, what's Channel 57 in Springfield? What's that? They published it back in the 1980s. You know, my dad now is 90. Okay, he can't tell a story anymore. So I'm here carrying on that story because this story, to me, is inspirational. Whether you like airplanes or not, okay, it's a story of five brothers that came from a farm in a town called Madison, New Hampshire, up near Lake Winnipesaukee in the White Mountains, where they had no high school in the 1920s. They had no high school, right? So what do you do if you're a kid and you got it going on and there's no high school, right? These guys left and they had a lead brother, the eldest, right? He was a spark plug. He clearly had a talent. He was inventing things on the farm, okay? And he left for Boston to strike out. Within five years, these brothers, when they got going, were building, they had set two world land plane speed records right here out of Springfield, Mass., right? They were at the top of the aviation world in 1931 and 1932. Aviation, you know, Lindbergh had just crossed the Atlantic in 1927, right? It was the biggest thing going on. There was nothing bigger, really, than, than aviation in 1929 and 1930, except for the Depression, and we'll talk about that. Okay, so that's the this, this setup. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to get into it now. Does everybody, does anyone know the GB story? A little bit. Okay, good. Here we go. All right, now, the first thing I'm going to do is start out with something fun, right? Because we can get into a historical story here. And uh, I'm going to ask you guys a quiz, okay? Because that is a GB. That is the GBR1. I don't know if you folks recognize it, but it will come out later when we go through the actual depiction, right? And the point I'm trying to make is this, these boys that were not even high school educated, okay? They came and then within five years, okay, put a stamp on the public consciousness so strong that here we are 90 years later and Disney is picking up and running a major film about it that grosses $250 million, you know, and it's a big deal. Okay, to me, that's pretty inspiring. That's pretty impressive because a lot of the other sessions we heard here is about people who are from aristocratic backgrounds, advantaged backgrounds, right? These people came from a farm. So does anyone know this film? Take a shot. Jack Coco? No, no. It was a follow-on to Cars. Not as big. Planes. Yes, it was planes. Okay, so we'll move this right along. Okay, so that's fun. That was in 2013, but in 1991, it wasn't the first time that they had done it, okay? Disney goes back, and um, so what 1991 Disney film featured the GBZ, which is the 1931 land plane speed record holder? Rocketeer. Rocketeer. That's right, the Rocketeer. In the summer of 1991, in an Art Deco theme, because this design that the brothers came up with, really in, a, in the aviation world, and, a, and even beyond that, I mean, this is pop culture, right? It defines Art Deco, and it defines that time between 1920 and 1930, 35, 39, but between the wars. Okay, a couple of things to remember as we go through the story here, the time. This is the golden age of aviation. It's the Depression era, so it's between World War I, World War II, the 1920s and 30s to be specific. After the crash in November 29, there's no money, okay? Not a lot of people, my grandfather remembers this, my father kind of remembers it, but we're losing it. We're getting further away from that, right? There's no money. The men, the Granville brothers of Springfield, Mass., five brothers from a farm in Madison, New Hampshire, no high school education, but the lead, the eldest brother, is a natural engineer and a natural inventor. He created many things on a farm from a raised gate so that they didn't have to shovel snow to, you know, a sawmill that was mobile that they could roll around. They built the fastest airplanes in the world. We've been talking about the machines. Um, they won many races, set many speed records. They did not sell a whole lot. That's why the company didn't last very long. And by the time, you know, the late 30s rolled around, it was gone. The racers uh, were innovative and they pushed the envelope to the very end to achieve their 
ultimate goal, which is to be the fastest airplane in the world. I, I have a paren there, R1 exhibited, because that's when I talk to the docents where they have a beautiful R1 replica hanging up in the, in the transportation hall in the Springfield Science Museum. If you want to see the real thing in real life, take a trip out to Springfield or go down to the New England Air Museum in Bradley Field. You'll find another replica down there. The real ones of these races are no longer existent. There's one uh, down in Mexico City that um, still exists. It's the uh, GBQED. And we'll show a picture at the very end of that. Uh, but, but importantly to me, too, is that the designers and the pilots, the folks who were involved in the racing, they went on to key roles in World War II, OK? Uh, Bob Hall, which was one of the main designers of the GB racers, uh, went to be a lead designer for Grumman Aircraft. And you know Grumman Aircraft was a reason that we were able to come out on top in World War II in the Pacific. So that's the backdrop. Here's the five brothers. Uh, you know, Mark Zanford, Tom, Ed, and Rob. Zanford is the oldest. He's the one that is the leader. But uh, they're, they're together in this story um, from start to finish. Now, Granny was, Zanford Granville was mechanically involved. Anybody here live in Arlington? I have a good friend of mine who lives in Arlington right off of Mass Avenue, which is not very far where Zanford Granville had his original automobile shop. He set up, he moved to Boston. There was no high school in Madison, New Hampshire. So he wanted to go find his future in, in the big city. He set up shop on Mass Ave. It's still an auto repair shop. It's still a gas, gas station. It doesn't look anything like that, but it's still there. And a couple of years after he was there, he saw an airplane fly overhead, as a lot of people did in the 1920s, you know, around Lindbergh's time in 1927. And he said, wow, that's great. I've got to learn how to fly. The first thing he did, though, is he said, I can fix those things. I can repair them because I'm an automobile, you know, I have a repair shop. So what he did is he took and he, he built a mobile repair shop on a truck, on a flatbed and took it to East Boston Airport, which is now Logan Airport. And he began offering services to repair aircraft flying out of uh, East Boston Air Airport. And the reason he had a mobile shop is because he didn't have the money and he couldn't, uh, he couldn't get space to set up a permanent shop at, Log at uh, Boston Airport. Not long after he began all the work on, on, the, on the other aircraft, he said, I can build another one. I can build a better airplane than what I'm working on. And he came up with the first GB, the Model A. It was a biplane. It was built in Boston. It was built at the airport, Boston Airport. And, and it flew well. It had unique features like interchangeable ailerons, interchangeable flight surfaces on the tail. And, um, he took it to the Boston business and banking community because he wanted to begin the business. This is when he first started. And he got nowhere. He got nowhere. This is before the crash, before November of 1929. He's trying to get financing, can't get financing. So he's kind of stuck, but he wants to build a company. He hears about an air show that's going on out in Western Mass in Springfield, a little airport called Springfield Airport owned by the Tate brothers who have a dance hall, and they have an ice cream, uh, you know, a, a big profitable ice cream business. Takes the Model A out to, to Springfield, flies it. The Tates look at it together with, their, with some of their influential pilots and say, wow, that's a great aircraft. They hear that he's looking for a place to build it. Tates say, build it here in Springfield. In fact, we'll take the dance hall that was off of Liberty Street in Springfield, and we'll actually let you use that to be your manufacturing site. So sure enough, they moved to Springfield. Boston lost out because uh, they, they had no room, no money in Boston. Come on. So he goes out here to Springfield, and they set up shop. Now, by this time, all of the other brothers from Madison, New Hampshire, are beginning to come down into to join the airplane business because now they've got a, a legitimate running business. It's not an idea anymore. They're actually beginning to build these Model A biplanes out of Springfield, Mass. 
was in another airport across the Connecticut River called Bowles Airport. And Bowles Airport was a little bigger. Have you ever heard of Bowles Airport? Not sure? Okay. I don't think it's there today. It's gone. There's Barnes Airport in Westfield, but not Bowles Airport. It was a little bigger, big enough to fly airliners out of. And, and in 1928 or 29, this is what airliners looked like. They were biplanes, and they flew off of a grass uh, airstrip. It was not like you knew today, and it was not always safe either. But, uh, you know, that was part of getting to where we're at today. Bowles Airport had a longer runway, and that factors into the story. We'll come back and we'll touch on that a little bit later on. Now, in between uh, Zanford Granville moving and the brothers coming down, setting up shop in Springfield, they're manufacturing Model A biplanes. But the depression hits, the crash hits in November of 29, and it's, it's awful. There is no money, there's no funding, and worse yet, there's no buyers. There's no buyers for the airplanes that you're trying to build. Okay, so what do they do? They say, all right, we're going we're gonna to go up market. We're going to go up market, and they design a sexy, you know, rakish, low-wing sportster um, that becomes the beginning of the, of the GB aircraft racing line. And it also becomes the beginning of their, uh, their thirst for prize money. Okay, because they're not selling a lot of airplanes, and the, and the only way they can make money is by winning races and the prize money that comes in the awards, right? So Lowell Bales, one of the one of the pilots at Springfield Airport, who then aligns and becomes the top pilot with the Granville brothers to fly the GBs, enters a an event, not really a race, a reliability tour in 1930 called the All American Air Derby, that basically flew from city to city across most of the United States. It was a demonstration that air travel was here, and it was good, and that, you know, to the general public who turned out at each one of these stops, you know, you can feel comfortable getting in an airplane and, and flying and going places. They won second place out of nowhere with their first, their first uh, you know, serious non-biplane airplane. They, they win second place in the All-American Air Derby. And suddenly, Springfield Aviation is on the map. Massachusetts, you know, I mean, all of the other competitors around the country, <coughs> Springfield produces an airplane that, that and generates $7,000 in, uh, in prize money, okay, for second place. And I, I was listening to Margo and, and uh, some of the other folks in sessions, you know, in 1929 or 1930, $7,000 was probably the equivalent of about $70,000 today, but it still wasn't a lot. They weren't selling any planes. It was enough to keep the business going, okay? But you look at the turnout in, ter in, in terms of the people in front of City Hall, um, they're off and they're running and they're known, but they're not selling what they really want to sell is, is Model A biplanes and GB Sportsters that they've designed. The market is still dry. We're in the middle of the Depression. It's not good. So what do they do? They develop another model. And if you look at it, this one is called the uh, Senior Sportster, the GB Model Y. This one was designed as a commercial aircraft, so a corporate aircraft of the time. Okay, it, it's hard to believe it with an open cockpit and uh, looking like that, but this was a corporate aircraft. In fact, this one was, the first one was bought by Maud Tate. Tate, I'll get to that in a minute. But the second one, there were two made, was bought by E.L. Cord, the guy who owned and ran the, the Cord Automobile Company at the time. Do you guys know the Cord, you know, the, the just unbelievably Art Deco car from the, from the early 1930s, right? And he had enough money where he could buy one. So this is Maud Tate in this aircraft. And you can see that it begins to take on those characteristics of the racers, you know, the big ones that we'll get to in a moment here. The wheel pants, the big radial engine is there on front, you know, just, just a massive amount of power, 450 horsepower, Pratt & Whitney Wasp in this one. And by the way, that's where Springfield helped out, right? Because Pratt & Whitney, you guys probably know Pratt & Whitney's still around today. And where are they? 
there in Connecticut, just down Route 91 from Springfield. And these brothers, the Granville Brothers Aircraft Company, did not have money. Okay, so what often happened is Pratt and Whitney would loan a motor, loan an engine, you know, their latest and best engine, and test it out with these guys under the most grueling racing conditions. It's kind of like, you know, Ford taking their new uh, GT40 or whatever and running it into, running into, they don't run it into NASCAR, I know that, but it's kind of the same idea, right? Ma Tate is interesting, right, because She's a woman, right? And what the heck is she doing in the cockpit of this, uh, of this really hot airplane, right? But um, there she is. And, and you know, it's a great story about, about women in aviation at this time. It was definitely male dominated. In fact, all of the racing was, you know, 99% male classes and then a couple for women. They had a powder, powder puff derby. They had an air all trophy race, national air races. Yeah but there were women pilots. Maude was the daughter of one of the Tate, uh, the Tate owners of the airport. She could afford to buy one. What's interesting about her story is she went to the McDuffie School, I don't know if it's still there, in Springfield, it's still there? Granby. In Granby, they moved it, right? Well, anyway, she went to the McDuffie, it's private school, right? So she, she was well off. Went to a private school, studied to become a teacher. You know, she was a teacher, and in fact, she went on two years teaching, uh, you know, elementary or high school, I don't know, but she was a teacher for two years and then she said, the heck with this. I'm seeing what's going on down at the airport and I want in. She threw all of that away and became, um, you know, the first woman uh, transport, first female aviator awarded a transport commercial license by the Department of Commerce in New England. That was Maud Tate in that time. And there were other women, you know, I mean, I love this. Uh, I put this picture in here because uh, my favorite, you know, you look at the styles that they were wearing. These were brave women because these things would crash as you would, as you read about. Uh, the third woman from the right, Florence Klingensmith, will come back in the story. I wanted to bring it out. She was probably 25 years old at this time. 25 years old, just a kid, right? Now, Mary Hazlip on the, fried, on the far right, I love her look here because number one, she's wearing a dress while she's flying these airplanes in, 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 in you know, pylon racing, right? But look at her eyes, look at the look on that face. That is a determined woman and she wants to win. And she did in fact hold the, hold the women's speed record for a period of time. All right, so the Model Y is built as a commercial aircraft, but the Grambles take it racing because you know what? They learned with the X that I can make money and we can keep our business afloat doing it. The Y is the single most successful air racer in the whole GB line. It's forgotten now. There are a few replicas around, but it was in terms of generating uh, prize money, it was the most successful racer. So in 1931 or for 1931, the brothers decide, okay, we're in the depression. We're going full on racing and we're gonna design and build the fastest airplane in the world, okay? And that design was the GB Model Z. This is not the one exhibited. You won't find it in Springfield. You won't find it in Bradley Field, okay? But this is the one that started it all from, you know, from the uh, unlimited racing perspective. And you can see the big radial engine up front. You can see the, the teardrop uh, streamlining in the fuselage is beginning, the rakish wheel pants. This is the design that uh, Dave Stevens, when he drew out the Rocketeer comic book in the 90s, that's what he saw and he said, man, that is like a comic book item just sitting there, right? It's crazy, right? So um, to build it, they had to raise money. So they formed the Springfield Air Racing Association, Sarah, as a company and they sold stock in the company, $100 shares. Now remember that $100 was probably at least $1,000 or more now, right? They raised $5,200, they built that with, with, the, with the money raised, they had no money. At the time, when they built the Z, they brought in a new, a new designer, 
a college-educated designer. Because to this point, it was Zanford Granville, who, remember, doesn't even have a high school education. He doesn't even have a high school education, right? They, they bring in Bob Hall, who's university-educated aeronautical engineer, OK? And he has a, a hand in it, OK? It was designed together with Zanford Granville and Bob Hall. And then it was built by the all five Granville brothers. This is a shot on a maiden flight. Bob Hall was 26 years old was to be, at some point in his future, vice president for Grumman Aircraft, uh, you know, developing fighters that were, were, would go on to, to, to help and win in the Pacific, right? He had to take off in Springfield and land in Bowles because this airplane had no flaps. It had no way to slow it down. It was extremely fast, and they needed the long runway at Bowles Airport in Aguam to actually land this thing. So the GBZ is off and running. And sure enough, they enter it in the 1931 National Air Races in Cleveland. In the premier event, the Thompson Trophy race, which, by the way, is not just premier in the United States. It's premier across the world in the world of aviation, right? This is where the fastest and best airplanes, whether they're military or private, it doesn't matter. That's where they're being raced. And he wins it. They're on top of the world. The Granville brothers, this is 1931, two years after Zanford builds his first Model A biplane in Boston. Two years. Incredible, right? Just incredible. So they're on top of the world. They come back to, to Springfield. And here they are in Mr. Tate's roles, I think, right? I mean, you know, they were quite well off. They come back to a ticker tape parade and with $20,000 in prize money in their pocket. Because not only did Bales win first place in the Thompson Trophy race, the unlimited race, but Bob Hall flew the Y to fourth place in that same race. Maude Tate, you can see her with the hat behind the flowers. She won the woman's uh, air all trophy race in the Y as well. And they won several other uh, lower level races. $20,000 was an incredible amount of money. They came back to Springfield. They paid all of the investors in the Springfield Air Racing Association who had bought stock shares just a year prior. They all got their money back with more, with, with, with gains, right? So this is right in the middle of the Depression. It's, it's just incredible, right? These guys are on the top of the world. They take the plane and they have it exhibited they tow it through Springfield. They have it exhibited at the uh, Eastern States Exposition. Big deal. They decide they're on top of the world, so they're now, we're going for the official world land plane speed record. So what do they do? You know, this is, these are in days, you know, 1931. <laughs> it, they didn't have computers. They didn't have, I don't know, did they have slide <laughs> rules? Probably did, right? What they did is they stuck a bigger engine on the thing. They went to Pratt & Whitney. They said, OK, we had a 500 horsepower motor on the front end. We're going for the land plane speed record. What's the, you know, what can we put on the front end? They said 750 horses. So they put it on the front end. And you can see it really begins to look kind of cartoonish now. But boy, it was a powerful, powerful airplane. And, and they had pretty good bet that they, in Detroit, they were going to be able to take the world land, speed, land plane speed record. So this is 1931, two years after the Model A biplane. They're going to pull the land plane speed record from France, which, which owned that record to that point. They set up in Detroit. There's a speed trap. The FAI, which is the international governing body for uh, competitions like this and setting international records says that you've got to fly below 150 feet. Below 150 feet, you can see it here in this picture. And you've got to fly through a speed trap with clocks on either end. OK, and we're going to time it. How so far apart was it? I don't know what the course was. That's a good question. I, I don't think it, maybe a mile, you know, maybe a mile. I don't know. That's a good question. I'm going to research that. Sorry, I can't answer it. But anyway, on that first run, OK, they break the record at 284,000, 284, 
miles per hour. It doesn't seem that fast, does it now? You know, you get in your airliner and you look out the window, you're going like four or 500 or something like that. 284. They beat it, but guess what? One of the watches malfunctions at the start or the end of the trap, right? So they have to run it again. And you know, this is a story of triumph and tragedy, right? You know what happens in that second run, right? He comes barreling down, enters the course, and something happens, right? The right wing snaps off, and he just spins and rolls right into the ground, a fireball. And Lowell Bales, who had just won you know, the fastest uh, unlimited race in the world at the National Air Races, he's dead. He's dead. In fact, I think that's his body right there in front of the automobile. Um, and the company is just, uh, just you know, just mortified, right? They're just in mourning. They can't, can't believe it. They had just set the record. So they award, the FAI awards the record, record to Lowell Bales posthumously, knowing that it won't stand for long, okay? And it's the Granville brothers who want to make sure it doesn't stand for long, and they're going to they're stay on top, right? So despite the tragedy of losing their, their best pilot out of Springfield Airport, they say, we're going to build a bigger and a better and a faster airplane, the GVR-1. And this is the iconic one that I showed that Disney picked up in the, in the planes movie. This is the one, the replica that you have hanging in your transportation museum, right? It, was, it took all of the design features of the Z and pushed them to the limit, OK? It was wind tunnel tested, and it was designed professional engineers, a new engineer called uh, Howell Miller, Pete Miller, came on and he joined the team. Bob Hall left. He left when the Z crashed because, you know, this is where history you don't really know. But it's, it's said that he didn't fully agree with the re-engineing of the 750 horsepower motor in, in the Z because it wasn't designed for that kind of power, right? You, no wonder things happen when you push the envelope that much, things will happen. So they go back to the Springfield Air Racing Association. They raise funds. They sell stock. OK, stock gets sold. One pilot comes forward from Cape Cod. A guy named Russell Boardman steps forward. Boardman had just made a distance flight in 1931 from Hyannis Airport to Istanbul, Turkey. It was a big deal. It was the longest transcontinental flight at the time. And it happened right out of Hyannis. It's, we all live in Massachusetts. Do we really, are we aware of this stuff happening? No. Anyway, Boardman buys 50% of the stock. And why does he do it? Because he wants to fly the darn airplane in the unlimited race at the National Air Races in Cleveland in 1932. He wants the glory, right? And we'll see how the uh, events turn out. So they build this airplane. And it's beautiful. It's iconic. Right? This is an image that just keeps coming back. When you hear about racing aircraft, OK, more than likely you'll see this one. And it was built in 32. You know, even today in, what, 2019, you know, what kind of racing aircraft can you name that has, that has the kind of enduring appeal? I don't think it's. So anyway, they build this, which may be the most famous racing aircraft of all time. And what's interesting is Boardman's supposed to fly it that summer at the National Air Races in the Unlimited Air Race, the Thompson Trophy Race, so they can win back to back, 31 to 32. But what happens? Boardman's flying out of Springfield or maybe another airport. He crashes on landing. The control, control stick goes right into his belly. He's in the hospital. He's not going to be able to fly the GBR-1, after the whole team has put all this effort in, he's put up 50% of the funding for the airplane, and he can't fly it. So we've got potentially the world's fastest airplane without a pilot. OK? Now here we have Jimmy Doolittle. I don't, does anyone know the name Jimmy Doolittle? People know this is great. Jimmy Doolittle, perhaps one of the most legendary figures in aviation, right? And even by the time at this point, in 1932, Doolittle was famous. He had won the Schneider Cup race. He, had, he was an MIT graduate, by the way. Okay, And he, uh, 
he worked with MIT and several other universities on uh, blind flying, closed cockpit, blind flying, instrument flying. He was, of course, going to be in this race, right? And his airplane, the Laird Solution, he was out testing it, shaking it down, has an accident, belly lands the thing. So here's Jimmy Doolittle, or, you know, arguably the world's best racing pilot without an aircraft. So you've got the GBR-1, the best airplane, you know, potentially, and Jimmy Doolittle, Zanford sees it, the Granville brothers, they connect the dots, they put them together. Doolittle comes to Springfield, he flies the R1, he says, I can do it, I can fly this thing, it's a little bit dicey, I can, I can take it. Of course, what does he do? The triumph, we haven't hit the peak yet, gang, we haven't hit the peak, right? He takes it, for the second year in a row, he wins the National Unlimited Thompson Trophy race. He beats all other comers, you know, the military, anyone he's in, beats them all like running away. And the Granville brothers in Springfield are on top of the world. They're on top of the world. They bring a trophy back. There's another parade in Springfield. It's hard to believe. There's another parade. They exhibit the R1 at the, at the Eastern States Exposition <laughs> again. Right? And uh, right after that, even before Boardman, who paid the money, you know, he wanted to be able, he wanted that win. He didn't get it, okay? He didn't even get the world speed record because Doolittle, right after winning that uh, Thompson Trophy race, took the airplane and said, okay, we're gonna set legit legitimately now. This is a year after Bales is dead, okay? And they go and they set the world land plane speed record um, in the GBR one. So this is two years in a row. The boys from Springfield originated no high school education. They've got professional engineers helping them now, but just they're on top of the world. But they're still not selling airplanes. They've got a lot of glory, right? Their racers are on top of the world, okay? But they're not selling the biplanes. They're not selling the sportsters. They're not selling the wives. They're on the verge of of insolvency. They're barely, barely keeping it together. And Zanford, pictured here, goes back to racing. They continue racing. In fact, after Doolittle takes the R1 and sets the world land plane speed record in, you know, after the summer of 1932 in the air race, Boardman decides to fly that same airplane which was designed as a closed circuit racer, a pylon racer. You guys know what I mean there, right? It's closed circuit. It's not designed to fly really even in a straight line. But he decides he's gonna take an entry in the Bendix race, which is a race from Los Angeles to New York, okay? And he crashes in one of the mid stations, okay? And is killed, okay? So now we have another tragedy. We have, we have first we have Lowell Bales, the Granville brothers, you know, premier pilot coming from the beginning. And then we have Russell Boardman, another Massachusetts pilot, a record holder, flew to Istanbul, Turkey. He's also gone, right? So the, the, the setbacks are mounting for the team. And in fact, in that same year, or just after 1932, in 1933, we come back to Florence Klingensmith. You remember she was the, the third one in a row of female flyers, flyers. Well, here she is, 26 years old, enters the Chicago Air Races in 1933 and enters the Unlimited Race in 1933. The only woman flying against all men in the highest horsepower ships, you know, was very similar to the National Air Race and the Thompson Trophy Race. The Model Y by that time is no longer in the control of the, uh, of, the G of the Granville brothers. It's been purchased by the Cord Company and it's been modified. It's got a bigger motor on it. It seems like a common theme, you know, more horsepower, more speed, it's what people do. And, but the airplane wasn't designed for that. She flew it in the, in the air race, went around the pylon and Zanford's watching from the ground. He's watching her do a fabulous job you know, rounding the pylons when all of a sudden the fabric rips from the inside uh, wing panel and she straightens out, you know, tries to bail out. She couldn't bail out, okay? And she went in and she, she was killed, right? Um, 
So there's this, the, the tragedies mount as, even as they're on top of the world. And this is the airplane. So, so at this point, the, the company is, is, is nearing insolvency, okay, because they're not selling the commercial aircraft. They need to sell to really be an airplane company, okay? They're on top of the racing world. They continue to build at the very end of the Granville Brothers Aircraft Company. This is 1934. So, you know, what, what it blows my mind here is that it all happened from 1929 to 1934. All of this in four years. I mean, if you were looking at modern world and you had to develop something that could set back-to-back -back world records and dominate the aviation scene, you know, the only thing you can think of is social media today and what the kids, what, what guys are doing today, what people are doing in social media today. It's the only thing I can think of that's pretty, you know, Elon Musk sending up a sports car and putting into orbit, I think is, it's probably there, you know. So anyway, this one's an interesting story. As the, as the Granville Brothers organization is falling apart, okay, they build one last racer called uh, the GBQED. And uh, QED is Latin. I can't remember the Latin words, but it was Latin for it will be demonstrated. It was meant to be a demonstrator again to sell commercially. And in this, in this case, actually to the military, because by the time we're in 1934, the clouds of war are already beginning to form in Europe, right? This airplane was, was flown, this GB was, QED was flown in the 1934 Mack Robertson race from London to Melbourne, Australia, by another woman, Jackie Cochran. Okay, and she, she whoops, how do I get rid of that thing? Here we go, thank you. Um, she's been recognized as, a, as just, you know, a very influential pioneer uh, racing pilot in a stamp, and I put it on there. But at this time, you know, her story, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit, because it's such a cool story. I love these back in this time, right? She was a beautician. Jackie Cochran was a beautician. She was a hairdresser, right? And she decided that I like what's going on with these airplanes. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna learn to fly. And not only does she learn to fly, but she goes right to the edge on the most advanced, the fastest, most dangerous airplanes uh, that are out there. So Jackie Cochran, you know, she, that was the beginning. She went through World War II. She helped to set up the waves and in the Air Force, so she was a very influential person um, and a pilot coming who had an associ association with the Granville brothers. In 1934, she was a Lucky Strike girl, the cigarettes, and that airplane was painted Lucky Strike green and gold for the registration numbers on the, uh, the registration numbers were gold. Okay, so Things are still happening on the racing scene. Meanwhile, Granville, Zanford Granville, the lead brother and the lead in the business, is flying around the U.S. trying to drum up business. He's, he's visiting commercial accounts. He's going city to city, trying to keep his company afloat. And he's doing it in this airplane. In the middle of winter, he's flying an open cockpit. That's what they did in, 19, in the 1930s. He, is coming to land in one of his cities on one of his calls, and there's a worker for some unforeseen reason in the airstrip, right? He's coming down, he has no time to go around again. He pulls up, the airplane stalls, it spins in. He dies, it's a crash. So now you've lost all of these pilots, Zanford Granville, the, the, the head of the, the, the Granville Brothers Aircraft Company, he's gone. And it's, you know, like 1934. So the company dissolves, and the Granville Brother Aircraft Company is no longer after five years or so. Um, but the designers that continue, continued, um, they continued on, right? And in fact, Pete Miller was the guy who worked with Zanford and worked with the team to design the R1, the big barrel-shaped red and white you know, classic racer. He went on and he, de he developed this racer for another uh, noted pilot. This guy lived in Connecticut, um, you know, north of Hartford, I believe. Frank Hawks was a famous pilot. And uh, that was called The Time Flies. It was sponsored by the Gruen Watch Company. 
and it was Pete Miller's one of his best designs. They tried to to take it and sell it to the uh, to the military as a fighter because when you look at it, it has all of the characteristics of the fighters is heading into World War II. It's got a retractable landing gear. It's got the radial engine with the three bladed adjustable pitch prop, right? So these were the airplanes that led up into you know the Grumman fighters in a Pacific theater, the Republic fighters in the European, European theater. And uh, so you could make the case, which I like to do, that the Granville brothers, you know, coming from a farm in Madison, New Hampshire, okay, where, the, you know, plowing fields with oxen, okay, to developing the fastest airplanes in the world, I mean, you could argue that they really did change the course of history. Because if we didn't have the planes, if, if, if Bob Hall didn't go to work for Grumman, I mean, would we have been in the same place in the Pacific Theater? So this is just a little timeline. I'm not going to go through it. I'm done my presentation now. So uh, thank you very much. That's the story of the Granville Brothers aircraft. You know, it's just a tremendous, to me, inspirational story. Thank you. Any any questions? Questions? Sure. Go ahead, Clifford. Mod Pace. Yeah. Gave up flying at some point, right? To start a family or whatever. At least that's the way I heard it. She did. Do you know, she did. Do you know the story a little more about her? I don't. I don't know. Well, you know, she became influential, like uh, like Jackie Cochran went on to form the Waves in World War II, which is an organization for female pilots and women pilots in World War II. Uh, she had a similar role, I think it was with the NAA, the National Aviation Association, where, and, and, I, and the other thing she did too is not, it was while she was still flying, when low, bail, low bails got killed, she lobbied internationally and said, this is crazy that the speed run has to be done at 150 feet altitude. There's no reason for that. It should be done at 500 feet at least so that there's some chance to recover and, and you don't immediately get killed. What I do know is my father gave a version of this presentation. He, he was doing all the research back in 1985 or 1986, and he did actually get to be quite friendly with, with uh, Bob Hall, Bob, Tom, uh, Bob uh, Granville, and uh, Pete Miller, and he gave a talk, and uh, Maud Tate showed up in the audience. This was 1985. She showed up in the audience, and she, he said that she looked, she wore a mink coat. They were rich, right? They had money. She wore a mink coat, you know, very, just, she just looked like a movie star. It was people walked into the presentation, and she looked like a movie star. That's all I can say. You know, I don't know the rest. I think she had some influence. Any other questions? I'll make more of a comment. You figure you got a you got a, an aircraft that's made out of basically fibers that are glued together. They're throwing on engines that are a third more powerful and not, I guess, changing maybe amounts, maybe your yeah. Capsules it was a different time, aircraft. right? Exactly, and that's what came out after Florence Florence Klingon Smith in the GBY when the, when the fabric tore off her wing panel, you know. The guy said, and Zanford said, and he, he, he watched the crash, right? Imagine what that was like. Uh, but he said, you know, the rib spacing, for example, wasn't set up for that kind of horsepower. There, you, you know, the plane wasn't designed for it. So, and this was, again, again all before the FAA, you know what I mean? Kinda but, yeah, had yeah. The on the so, you know, you wonder about, that's what I mean when you look back and you say they achieved that in four years at a Big cost, right? There was a big cost to it. Could it have ever happened again, right? And ask yourself, if that didn't happen, if we didn't have that private development happening in the 30s, would we have really been in a place in 1939 or 1940 when Pearl Harbor happened and we entered World War II? I don't know. No one will know. No one will know. I see that happening again today with going beyond our planet space, you've got all these private companies yeah, yeah. now doing their own thing with yeah. their own designs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love Elon Musk because he reminds me of these guys and what he, you know, he's just, he's doing it. And I, you gotta give him credit. Go ahead, question. Yeah, um, you showed, you were saying something that they didn't have tail flaps, but like the last, the plane you showed, the, the white one, I think it was the Model D or something, <coughs> 
that they extended the body length through. Yeah. And the pilot was sitting way, way at the back. Yeah. So it looked like it had a, a little flap that kind of went down. That wasn't movable at all? No. The R1, R2, and all of the developments after that didn't have wing flaps. Yeah. The wing flaps change the angle of attack the wing. When you fly on an airliner, you can see it. When they're coming in, they drop the flaps, right? Yeah. They were just being introduced oh. in the 1930s. Is that the form of just adjustable, basic adjustable trim then? They didn't have them. They didn't have flaps. That's why they needed, you know, there's been a replica built that's down in Kissimmee, Florida by Kermit Weeks. He has it now in R2. And uh, Delmar Benjamin flew the aircraft. I saw it. He flew it up in New Hampshire, and I saw it fly. And he did all kinds of aerobatics with it to demonstrate that this was a sound design. It was not the airplane. The airplane in 1931, 32 was probably ahead of the pilots at the time, actually, to some extent. And he said that when you land that thing, if the landed tail high and you have to change the tires out like every fifth flight because you're burning rubber on your tires and they're not going to last, right? So that's what he would do. But did they know that in 1932? Probably not, right? Any other questions? Sure. They dispersed. So um, Bob Granville went back. He, he went to Maine and he bought a farm went back to his roots. So several of them, a couple of them went back to the farm. Some of them might have went back to New Hampshire. A couple of them went to work for either Sikorsky or Pratt & Whitney, I forget. They stayed in the aviation industry. They stayed local. Um, but they all dispersed, you know. The story was over. Yeah? So why their, their planes didn't, didn't sell? Why? Why, why? why their planes did not sell? It was a depression, primarily. The no well, well they, they sold a few, like it, you know, that, that first low wing sportster, they sold a couple of them to, you know, Harold Moon of the Harvard, Harvard Flying Club in Cambridge. He bought one. But those. It's just general depression. Yeah. Wasn't specifically them. Well, you know, there were some aircraft companies, like, uh, like um, what's the one I, I want to think of? Waco, for example. There were some other ones that did manage to get through the. the did get managed to get through the depression, so it was done. You know, Stinson. I think what happened with with these folks is that they got pointed in that racing direction. They felt the money, they felt the cash flow, and they 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 continued to go in that direction, and at a cost. You know. Did they try to market any type of a multi seat plane instead of just the? They were just trying to sell that. Single person, single use. No, plane? actually, the Y was a two seater. They had, they had fared over the front cockpit for racing, right? But it was intended to be a corporate aircraft. It doesn't look like one now, but in 1931, that's what they looked like, you know, open cockpit. They were all open cockpit at that time. Uh, and they did, late in the life, as they were kind of, you know, searching for an answer, they designed. They went in a couple of different directions, designing passenger airliners and transports. but. It was too late. They couldn't get the funding to build them. The company was, was insolvent by that time. Sure. Do, do you have any idea, you know, a few years later, we're in the Second World War, and were any of the surviving brothers working in aircraft design or contributing? Yeah, well, not the brothers, not the brothers, but Bob Hall, who was the lead engineer for the GBZ, the first one. Mm -hmm. Okay, he became a vice president at Grumman on Long Island, and he was so influential in building the, uh, I don't know if you know World War II fighter aircraft, right, but the Grumman Wildcat, the Hellcat, the Bearcat, the Tiger Cat, mm -hmm. he was responsible for all of them, right? And uh, so he, w and, and you know, another thing about Bob Hall is he formed a, uh, the Hall Mast Company, so he was a sailor in it for, for fun, for his hobby, and uh, he had a, in fact, here's a story. When he was vice president at Grumman, he had a, he had a big sloop uh, down on Long Island Sound. And, you know, he would invite his employees. He would take them out, and they'd go sailing on his sloop. But he formed the Hall, a company called the Hall Mast Company. They manufactured masts, and I think that company might still be going, actually, today. That is Hall Spars. Hall Spars? Do you know? Island. Yeah. On Long Island, right? No, Bristol. Bristol, uh, Rhode Island. Yeah, they're still there, right? And that, that was a, you know, that was the Grumman years, I think, is when, when that came to pass. Go ahead. 
in the in Roman tradition that he gave his uh, suit to sea cat or something like that? I don't know. That would be cool, wouldn't it? I, I doubt it. I doubt it. Okay, well, everybody, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I hope you had a good day.